Hi everybody, my name is Chris. I'm the VP of Engineering and co-founder of a company called Zintasso, where we work with our clients to help them treat their platforms as a product. And we're also behind Kratix, the open source framework that enables platform engineering teams to build their platform their way. Now today, I'm gonna to speak a little bit about Backstage and why Backstage alone does not make for a great platform. Now, we're all here today at PlatformCon, hopefully here to learn about the latest and greatest technologies and patterns and thought leadership in the platform space. And we're doing this because we wanna offer a better experience to our users, the application developers, and various other users of our internal platforms. Now, simply put, a platform is a set of self-server products that serve or enable other products and services teams within organizations to move more quickly. In the past few years, there's been an explosion in the platform engineering space. We've seen tools emerge, we've seen patterns emerge, we've seen thought leadership emerge, and we're seeing more and more platform teams form within organizations. We're seeing investment in platform engineering teams go up over time. It's really great to see. And the reason we're doing that is because organizations are all chasing that platform dream. Everyone's looking at ways to reduce costs. If there's a, a pattern or a service within an organization that can be consolidated and not kind of reproduced across many application teams, that's a great opportunity for a platform team to take that service on board and run it in one single place to serve back to users. It's an example of how costs can be reduced. All organizations today are looking to increase their speed. We're all trying to move quicker, innovate quicker, get products to market quicker, so we can outmaneuver our competition. Everyone in the tech space these days is looking to go, to go faster. And we're all trying to reduce risk. I'm sure we've all heard the horror stories of companies releasing unpatched software into production, unsecure software into to production that can be exploited and companies can be taken down. These days, we all need to reduce our risk and platform teams are a great way of doing that. If security patterns can be properly encoded into workflows provided by platform teams, it means there's one less thing for application developers to think about and the security organizations within companies can be sure that their, their kind of security risks are being taken care of. Now, unfortunately, the pragmatic reality of uh, being in a platform engineering team does kick in. It's not all rainbows and unicorns in terms of the platform dream. I'm sure everybody here will be very well aware of the amount of learning curves there are in the platform engineering space. We're all learning day to day. We're all learning things ranging from public clouds to on-premise cloud, VMware. We're looking at learning Terraform, we're learning Chef, we're learning Ansible, we're learning Bash, we're learning Golang, we're learning Ruby. And that's before we even bring Kubernetes and all of the various kind of operator patterns and Helm technologies. And literally the list goes on and on and on in terms of learning curves in that platform engineering space. It's fun, but unfortunately that learning comes at the cost of productivity sometimes. Now on top of that, platform engineering teams are also trying to keep their platforms running. They're trying to keep the services that they offer up to date with the latest security patches, with the latest features, because ultimately we're trying to keep the users of our platform happy. So we need to get the features into their hands so they can, they can go off and build what they need to serve their customers. On top of that, we've got security patches. Everything needs to be secure all of the time these days. Platform engineering teams are having to worry about the workflows of keeping things up to date and the, the automation of all of that stuff. Another example of a learning curve there. Now on top of workflows and technologies, we also have to keep our stakeholders happy. Our stakeholders are not just the application developers using the platform. We also have stakeholders such as billing and the accounts teams who want to make sure that all of the public cloud usage is properly tracked and so it can be charged back. We have audit teams who demand that certain audit boxes are checked before software makes it into production in certain, in certain sectors. Again, just all examples of cognitive load that platform engineering teams have to take on board that prevent really rapid progress in this space. On top of all of that, obviously there's gonna be a skills gap because it's next to impossible to hire platform engineering team members that have 
all the skills that we've just gone through. There's a real demand for a real small set of resources right now in the industry. So there, all, all, there we have it, all examples of cognitive load that the platform engineering teams are having to take on. All examples of things that get in the way of platform engineering teams moving quickly. And ultimately, the result of all of that is that we're not sol solving our customers' needs and not solving your customers' problems really sucks. It re effectively leads us to having low job satisfaction. So what do we do? Well, we're engineers, so we all look for silver bullets. We look for those tools, those technologies, those design patterns that we can bring in that solve many problems all at once. In the platform engineering space, we've seen silver bullets come and go in the shape of, for example, Cloud Foundry. It's a great platform as a service um, technology. It really, on its day, could help application developers push and get code into productions really quickly, but it came at a cost. It was big, it was cumbersome, it, the learning curve was absolutely huge. It was very, very difficult to customize. We've seen silver bullets come along, such as Kubernetes. Again, Everybody on earth now runs Kubernetes in one, in one shape or another, but it doesn't come without its costs. We could do a whole platform team talk on, on Kubernetes alone and some of the costs that come along with it. It's not a silver bullet. It's a great tool for building platforms, not necessarily a great abstraction to offer your developers to enable them to go quickly. Another example of, of a silver bullet that's come along recently is Backstage. Now, Backstage is a great user experience for platform teams to offer to their users. It's come out of Backstage in the last few years, and it offers a real powerful framework for you to declaratively create your UX for your platform. So you can offer that real consistent experience to the users of your platform. Now, the Backstage dream is you spin it up, you put it into production, you point your users at it, and off they go, and they have a real great platform experience. But unfortunately, the backstage reality is also real. You have to figure out how to architect it, how to deploy it. Do you run Postgres to store its state? Do you run Redis as a caching layer? Do you run the in-memory caching layer that it comes that it ships with? You have to figure out how to deploy its front end and its back end. On top of that, you have to secure it, you have to keep it up to date. And that's before we even get to the customization side of Backstage. To customize it, you have to learn React, you have to learn JavaScript, HTML. Again, yet more learning curves that your platform engineering teams have to take on. On top of that as well, if you don't get your design patterns right, you can really blur the abstractions about which area of your platform is responsible for which job. Again, all, all examples of yet more cognitive load that your platform teams have to consider. So yes, a low backstage can come along and solve a certain set of problems in the UX space. It doesn't come for free. It comes with a huge learning curve and it can be powerful if you consider that learning curve correctly. And it is powerful. At Syntasso, we're huge, huge fans of backstage and we've built some open source integrations into Kratics that we'll get into a little bit, a little bit later. It's an immensely powerful platform and you shouldn't dis discount it now, a really good example of an architecture um, for Backstage is, is kind of shown here. So Backstage itself ships with a tremendous amount of plugins that allow you to adapt your, your front-end Backstage views of the world to your back-end platform concerns. It has a really powerful plugin architecture. So you might have plugins that help you orchestrate your public-private cloud from your Backstage. You might have direct plugins to help you drive Terraform from Backstage. You can build custom plugins that allow you to customize backstage to drive your internal systems. It's super, super powerful. But if you're not careful, you can end up with a very, very leaky abstraction in terms of your platform. You can end up with your backstage having far, far too much knowledge of how your Terraform is supposed to run. You might have far too much knowledge in there in terms of your public cloud. Backstage isn't great, for example, at keeping everything super secure in terms of credentials. So you might have a security kind of hole kind of in there if you're not very, very careful. The point here 
is you need to consider your abstractions very, very carefully in your platform. I'm not you, sure I understand. You need to make, <laughs> sorry, series going off. So we all have to consider the abstractions of our platform very, very carefully. We need to make sure the right area of the platform is responsible for its responsibility. So in the terms of backstage, it should be responsible for the view aspect of the UX of the system. In terms of the kind of controlling the backend system and orchestrating that backend system, there's probably a better technology out there that allows you to, to kind of drive that. Be very careful about pulling too much platform responsibility into backstage, else your cost of development kind of increase. You might find yourself writing backstage plugins when all you want to do is kind of change a subtle workflow and how your Terraform is deployed. All of this leads to high cost of change. For example, if you decided you wanted to throw something, throw backstage away and bring in a better technology, I'm sure it doesn't take too much of a mental leap to, to kind of imagine the costs there if your backstage has too much knowledge about how your platform runs. Equally, you may choose to keep things very, very separate. And in that case, drift might happen. If you continue to invest in your platform abstractions and you make your platform abstractions the canonical kind of source of truth in terms of how your platform works and you don't keep your backstage up to, up to date um, with those new workflows, you'll find that your backstage drifts away from your platform. And all of this will reduce in... drop in terms of adoption and this is not good this leads to shadow it it leads to kind of under under investment in your platform engineering teams it'll lead to unhappy developers not great patterns to see in your org but what does good look like you should absolutely use backstage i'm not here to back to bash backstage at all i'm here to communicate that you should pick the right tool for the job and make sure that that job's responsibility is clear so in terms of backstage, a great model looks like where backstage is hooked declaratively into a platform abstraction that can drive backstage on your behalf. So backstage has a great declarative model. If you can have a platform that can declare the state for your backstage, you can keep the two in sync by your platform abstractions. And backstage is not unique here. This talk isn't really about why backstage is not great for platform building. This talk is about choosing your dependencies carefully, being very, very clear with your architectural decisions. Consider your pros and cons and always keep in mind that platform dream because your platform dream can be real. If you select the right technologies for the job and you really architect to enable those technologies to do the thing that they were designed to do, your platform experience can be very, very powerful and you can keep your users very happy. So consider your investment. Always, always bear your users in mind. Select technologies that are gonna help your users, not help your CV. Always consider your organizational speed. We're all trying to go fast here. We're all trying to keep our costs down. We're all trying to reduce risk. So pick the right technology for the job that was designed for the job that it's doing. And if you do all of these things, naturally you'll start to keep your team's cognitive load down. Now, Kratix, a framework that I touched on very, very earlier in the talk, is a framework that allows you to build your platform your way. Now, Kratix is a great example of a technology that can sit at that platform layer and help you orchestrate your backstage view. So Kratix has built-in plugins that will enable you to drive your backstage UI is you load capabilities into your platform using the Kratix concept of a promise. So by using Kratix, you get a lot of your backstage UX declarative for free. You can check out Kratix at kratix.io. There's quick starts on there that will allow you to get up and running quickly. Um, and you can see the backstage integration in action over there. So thank you for listening.